Hi there. My name's Paul Bennett and uh, we're going to be talking about physical activity and exercise and looking at the policy considerations for sustainable change. I'm coming to you from Adelaide, Australia. Um, Adelaide is the place where we uh, have kangaroos drinking beer. But more importantly, um, I wish to acknowledge and pay my respects to our traditional owners and we're coming from the land of the Ghana people, which is now known as Adelaide. Um, and Adelaide is pretty much down the bottom and that's where I'm speaking from today. I'd like to run you through some of our patients who we actually see at the beginning of dialysis. When they come in and they have their first dialysis, they're usually a little bit sick and symptomatic. But after a couple of dialyses, they actually uh, increase their, their, their activity, their wellness, and actually looking pretty good in the, in the first couple of years of dialysis. Over a period of time, however, you see this rapid deterioration um, in their physical um, function and their physical capacities, and they end up by being in a wheelchair in a brute. It's a very familiar sight. And unfortunately, when we give them a transplant early in um, this this um, uh, this progression uh, it usually works out well and unfortunately many people get their transplants when they're physically inactive and not very well. This is a problem. So those people with chronic kidney disease who are on peritoneal dialysis or hemodialysis are very inactive. You'll notice the red line um, up the top. Uh, it's certainly um, none of these uh, in these studies have got any of these studies in peritoneal dialysis on the left or hemodialysis on the right have got close to 10,000 steps more ranging in the two to 4,000 step area. Once you get to kidney transplant, however, you're a lot more active in general. We know that inactivity and mortality are closely linked in kidney transplant patients, so the more active you are, the lower mortality you have. Unfortunately, prior to kidney transplantation, People who are on dialysis have many barriers um, to exercise and uh, they're very physically inactive. You can see that 11% of hemodialysis patients and 14% of peritoneal dialysis patients are physically inactive in this recent survey. The reasons why they're more likely to be active is their comorbidities, which is high in people with kidney disease, um, the burden on the family. They have fears, which include fears of falling, and there's certainly a lack of exercise knowledge that um, we don't, we're not very good at giving. But in this group, similar to every other group, exercise is all about behaviour change. It's about going from the couch to the track. But the question we ask ourselves is actually, do people on dialysis want to exercise? Is there a want for it? Is there a, a want for this behaviour change? The answer is overwhelmingly yes. In a recent study we did, and this um, uh, um, combines nicely with other studies, is that 60 66% or two thirds of people who are in the in the study completed three months of exercise. 70% of these people continued the exercise three months post the finish of the study. So the answer is yes. People want to want to exercise. So it's, as Lance Armstrong would say, it's not just about the bike, or as we would say, it's really not just about the person with CKD. We need to help them and to guide them and to assist them. So yes, we can keep them alive through dialysis, but it's not a lot of point in keeping them alive when they're actually deteriorating physically and mentally. So how do we change these behaviours? Um, and more importantly, how do we ensure sustainability of exercise? One thing we've turned to um, over the last few years is we've used the behaviour change wheel, which is part of the COMBI, uh, um, the COMBI intervention strategy. And the behaviour change wheel is a model that seeks to capture both the factors that affect behaviours and the different types of interventions that can be used to change these behaviours. So it, it didn't just come out of thin air. This behaviour change model was developed um, uh, using the synthesis of 19 prior models of behaviour change. So it's been drawn from a relatively large evidence base. You can see it's represented by these three concentric circles. In the green, in the middle, sources of behaviour. 
in red, intervention and functions, what we actually do in our, uh, in our exercise intervention. And around the outside of the grey area, which are the policy categories. And I'll take you through this, um, mainly focusing on the policy categories. Just briefly, the sources of behaviour in the middle are about the, uh, relate to finding out what would need to change for the behaviour to change. So for people to go from the couch to the track in terms of capability, which is uh, the physical and psychological capability, their opportunity, both physical and social, and the internal motivation, reflective and automatic motivation in our group of kidney dialysis patients. So just in a bit more depth, capability refers to physical or psychological skills to perform the behaviour. Opportunity refers to physical or social influences that allow for the behaviour. And motivation refers to the reflective beliefs about the good and bad consequences of changing this behaviour and the automatic wants and needs to change that behaviour. So an example of automatic motivation applying to exercise interventions in this group would be Knowing, just knowing about the pleasures and understanding the pleasures or lack of pleasures of undertaking certain exercise programs. The red concentric circle really reflects and relates to the intervention aspects that, that we use. So what intervention are we going to do that influence this sustainable change? So once we've considered the internal green capability opportunity in, and, and capability opportunity, we can then decide what intervention functions to apply. And if we go around that red circle, um, there are fairly obvious intervention aspects such as education, persuasion, incentivisation, coercion, training, restriction, environmental restructuring, modelling and enablement. So for a potential exercise intervention such as the TheraBand intervention, such as this one here, to make it sustainable, we would need to think of education, training of staff, modelling by other experts, providing the environment and the bands, and maybe some short-term incentives to start off. For example, patient might be the first on the machine, which is quite important for some dialysis patients. So the outer grey section of the behaviour wheel, which we'll focus on now, focuses on the policy aspects. Not all of them apply to every intervention, so we can decide which policy aspects are important to us. And these might include guidelines, expert guidelines, um, some planning, communication and marketing, legislation, service provision, regulation, money and fiscal measures. Although this seems a bit dry and it's a bit bleh, this is where I think we, be I believe, we're letting our patients down by not addressing these relevant policy aspects. So no matter what motivation, no matter what a person uh, and um, has in their green area, no matter what the interventions, the good intentions that clinicians may have, it's these policy aspects that are not addressed and sustainability is very challenging. So I'll focus on these aspects in the remainder of the presentation as these are, are global and common to all dialysis providers around the world. So firstly, I think we need to explore and use the systems that are already in place. There's no one going to be coming with a whole bucket of new money. So what we can do is we can mandate funding linking, linked exercise and physical activity metrics like our quality metrics that we have and incorporate funding link metrics. It's important, and we don't do this very well in many places, to increase and improve our physical disability diagnostic coding. These two aspects can actually um, enable us to increase our funding and actually fund potentially something like a renal exercise professional which are, uh, are very missing in our area. Talking about renal exercise um, professional service permission, service provision, um, so to prevent for preventative exercise and rehabilitation programs they really rely on the coordination and alignment of primary, secondary and tertiary care. Unfortunately, these dialysis patients can get sometimes lost and fall into gaps where no funding exercise is provided. So what we need to do is we need to integrate appropriate clinical algorithms that include tailored exercise prescriptions. We need to ensure that we have nationwide policies that mandate some delivery of consistent and healthy lifestyle information. In England have been doing that over the last few years. It's been very impressive. We need to integrate cost-effective exercise professional models of care and include exercise and physical activity education and undergraduate and graduate renal profession trainings, which is sadly missing in most places.
as far as regulations and legislation go, we need to really support policy that endures liability cover because we don't want uh, to have health professionals worried about increasing liability when they're doing physical activity um, programs, which does occur. We can decrease this risk by introducing activity risk assessment. I think what's really important is to develop an education and accreditation process for renal and exercise professionals. Japan have done this with their renal uh, exercise group and GREX is developing an international education program. I think we really need to advance the idea of global clinical renal, renal exercise and physical activity and a research consortium and GREX are uh, uh, one group who are, who are trying to achieve this goal. We certainly need to create documents that recommend or mandate practice and that includes guidelines, disseminating protocols and recommendations. Greeks have done this to a certain extent in the peritoneal dialysis space. So people with peritoneal dialysis, they have a tube coming out of their uh, stomach and they get um, dialysate fluid uh, placed in their peritoneum and that um, it helps to fuse the waste out of their bloodstream. Uh, it's a very um, amazing um, uh, dialysis um, regime. Uh, however, um, certainly having a catheter stuck in your tummy uh, creates some activity issues. So. Uh, when we looked at the exercise recommendations, we now have practice points that enable um, clinicians to, um, to guide their patients and patients to guide themselves. And these can be in the timing of physical activity, so after they uh, have had their um, catheter inserted, how long it takes and what they can do, whether they can um, exercise with their fluid in or out of their stomach. Some of the specific activities that are really important, such as swimming and water sports, contact sports, their core strength, uh, can the activities around work, activities around sexual um, activity and sexual dysfunction. Um, some of the very difficult side effects that people have to go through often um, is a barrier. So the exercise care, perspiration, if you're cardiovascularly compromised, if you're frail, if you're fatigued, mental health issues. And also there's a section on dietary practice points um, if we have an obese patient or if you have a low baseline fitness levels. And this is an example of swimming and peritoneal dialysis practice points that goes through some of the practice points. Um, and in particular down the bottom we recommend that routine exit care should be performed after swimming and water sports and with a grading recommendation after that. So now we do have peritoneal dialysis guidelines, we do have some hemodialysis guidelines as well. One of the other grey wedges is about the environmental and social aspects of, um, of sustainability and policy. So we do need a policy around designing fitness areas, around storing exercise and around developing and coordinating policy supported funded group physical activities and exercise programs. Generally as renal professionals we're not that good at communication and marketing so we do need to use as much um, and support as possible. So encouraging local and regional, national, global nephrology associations to collaborate with rehab groups um, and to lobby government and policy makers. We can use um, uh, some of the um, some of the guidelines and booklets that we already have such as this one that's on the um, Kidney Health Australia uh, website that's free to download. So that's just a, a very short summary addressing the low uptake of exercise as a failure of potential policy more than a failure of a person's intrinsic capability opportunity and motivation. It's always going to be a struggle for any human to have um, the opportunity, motivation and capability. It's even harder for people with kidney disease on dialysis. So that's why I, in this presentation I focused on the policy aspects and these aspects may not just be relevant for the kidney disease population but also for other groups and potentially other groups could use these uh, the behaviour change wheel um, to establish and um, um, a sustained exercise program. For more information we've got um, a couple of articles that have been published on the behaviour change wheel as related to um, exercise in dialysis patients and uh, a global policy consensus statement. I think I'll just end with the fact that this is what our ultimate objective is, is to have people uh, living their normal lives uh, on dialysis. This fellow is catching a barramundi in a boat in northern Australia um, and he's still putting dialysis fluid in and out of his stomach. Thank you very much.